major technical difficulties. <laughs> That's not your fault. I mean, I got to get smarter or carries that one. Yeah. There we go. That looked great. Yep. Yeah. I've already heard the whole thing. Or something like that. Yeah, or the arrow buttons, I don't know, okay. whatever works better. Okay. Uh, no, I can do it because you won't know when I'm going to do it. I'm going to have to say do it. <laughs> Are you here? I'm here. Because, no, I could just roam then to my nervous energy. Okay. So we're still, we're still doing Jesus's parables. Uh, I think we're about halfway through it. We're going to call go through three today. Uh, I think I shared it. Oh, you did? Okay. So we can see it, but I don't think you can. One second. All right. Sorry. Let me make all these little adjustments here. Work or do we want more like this? All right. Now we're in business. We got it. All right. So uh, we're going to go through three of them today. Uh, Master and servant in uh, Luke. Uh, there's uh, there you go. Uh, unmerciful servant and the rich man and Lazarus will be the three that we go through today. So we'll start with this one. And if I could have a reader here, we got a few scriptures to read. So need some help. But which here I come. Oh, go oh. Ahead. Somebody in front of me. Okay, but which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise, yea, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Luke 17, 6 through 10. Very good. Thank you very much. Oops. So, yeah, I went back. Yeah, so um, does that make any sense to you? Thank you. No. Confusing. Well, a little clarifying here a little bit. Um, the Greek word for the man working for his master was called doulos, it said. And uh, Many Bibles translated the word doulos as a servant. So, so that man was a servant to the master. And in this word, the passage is described as slave. And, and again, when Jesus was talking in parables, he was talking to the Jews with language of the times. Of, 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 it doesn't maybe relate to us today. You know, so we have to kind of process what he was saying. But then... It was pretty evident to them when he was talking about this guy that was a slave in the field. Uh, he, he, the Jews understood, you know, what that was. And sometimes that wasn't just a, a guy that was working, laboring in the field. But it, in that time, you know, some of them were tutors and some of them were doctors and household managers and administrators. And right. it could have been anybody working for anybody at that point. But in case, case he, was a, he was a slave. He was out in the field plowing. He was laboring after the livestock and cooking and cleaning. And this master says, when you're done with that, clean up, come on in, make me supper, you know, so I can eat first. And then later you can do your thing. And, you know, we're thinking, well, that's kind of like kind of crude. That's not good. But that's the point that we was trying to make. You know, it, it wasn't literally what we think it would be. Um, was it fair for the master to expect the servant would prepare his meal after laboring in the fields all day? I mean, fair or not, that was the expectation. That was the thing. That's what you did. That was your job. And that was his duty at that point in time. So they were they were getting it. And uh oops, get it again. Okay. Okay. So um that society, you know, today, that that was one that he was trying to belabor the point of authority. 
the master said this to the slave and the slave did it. You know, it was, it was a couple things. I mean, in the, the, has God, has God uh, changed what his expectation is of us to him? And that's the parallel that Jesus was trying to put out there that, you know, as the slave is to the master, as is maybe you as you are to God in that regard. And I just put a couple of things here and I don't have my slide here, but um, in the 60s, the Girl Scout pledge said, this is how things have changed. On my honor, I will do my duty to God in my country, to other people at all times and to obey the Girl Scout law. Today's pledge, the same Girl Scout situation says, on my honor, I will try to serve God. And I put a little asterisk to that because God's not necessarily the only thing that people are trying to serve today mm -hmm. and my country to help people at all times and to live by the Girl Scout law, not to obey what the law is. So there's all of a sudden a, a transition from what God's expectation was of us obeying his laws to uh, uh, what we can kind of like rationalize today in our life that, you know, God is whatever you want him to be or it to be or any of that situation. And obey forget it that that's not a term that's any any anything that's anymore i probably not no, they, they you don't know want, they don't. yeah thank you i know they don't have to do that so forget it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well never mind <laughs> never mind i'm not gonna go there uh a softer <laughs> meeting you know Dropping the words duty and obedience from our relationship to God. And it was beginning, that's what Jesus was trying to reemphasize even in that day, mm -hmm. that they were beginning to wander from their duty to God. And he's saying, okay, here's how it's been. Here's how it needs to be. But, but in relationship to the master, that master is your God. And it says that you're going to obey him and you're not going to try, but you will obey the Lord. Sometimes God's not the focus anymore. There's other things now that people put in place of what they're going to worship or follow or whatnot. To be real disciples, we must be obedient to God's word and our duty as followers of Jesus Christ. And again, that's the point of this parable so long ago for us to learn today. Should the master be expected to thank his servants for doing what he was told to do? Yeah. No, because that wasn't the way it was, right? He was the master. And the slave's job was what it was. And the slave knew that. In our time, we would think this is cruel and unjust fun of it. That, that that's just not fair. The servant, though, understood at that time. He knew his duty and he wasn't going to shirk it. And the people in Jesus' time understood that. So should we expect thanks from God for obeying him or doing what he tells us to do? Well, I think the, the, the thanks is eternal life. And, and, and the blessings. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And it's hard for us to sometimes think that far ahead. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it the, the blessings of eternal, I mean, the blessings of eternal life would su supersede anything we could possibly experience here, mm -hmm. but that's not now. And so the, the concept of like living your entire life for a reward is um, when you can get, you know, <coughs> and so many other things now today. Yeah. It's just not the focus. No. And I think that's what God wants us to do. I think he wants us to think about, he wants us to have our minds thinking kingdom-wise mm -hmm. versus this life-wise. But how much time do I spend thinking about the kingdom? The yeah. Kingdom? I, yeah. I mean. Well, because we're busy, right? I mean, even it was beginning to happen there. When he created this parable, people were starting to wander and drift and thinking about other things rather than that relationship with God and what God has done for them and what they needed to do. And it was maybe a, a literal translation that that man was out there plowing the fields and taking care of the cattle and all that, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, we have a lot to do as well. But in that case, the master said, you know, that was fine. That was your job, but you're not done yet. You got to serve me too. And that's kind of like today. We're occupied, we're busy. We don't necessarily have our time, but we, what we like the Girl Scout Pledge, we drift and wander in terms of our responsibility <coughs> to God and what that should be. You know, we will try, not we will obey. We will try. We'll give it our best shot. And then we expect 
later on that forgiveness will come in and everything would be cool because he knows who we are and what we can do. So maybe, maybe not. You're right. I mean, why I risk it, right? If then, yeah. kind of thing. If we keep his commandments, if we obey him, like Lynette said, then we will receive eternal life. But in this life today, you know, again, life's not going to be perfect and we're not going to have trials, but we will have blessings if we keep him and obey him, keep his commandments, then there will be blessings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the more we focus on that and obey him, then more blessings will come. Yeah. But I think too, the concept of like worshiping God as a priority, even you know, on top of our everyday work responsibilities, but that's essentially what these these people were, the servants. So you can consider them employees. I mean, mm -hmm. They were basically yeah, employees. That's true. They were for whoever their servant was, their master was. And um, you know, we studied this in, in ladies' circle, but you can, like, the, the, the concept of slave or, you know, indentured servant or employee, whatever we call them today, was um, really only for two reasons, either you were too poor to take care of yourself, and so you went to work for someone else, somebody else, or you had done something wrong and there was some crime that you mm -hmm. yeah, to pay the price. Not, so that was the price you paid where you were to be a servant for seven years so that was that was the concept um so the the idea for us today is like you know well we have employers we have jobs we have responsibilities but i think god still wants us to serve him in addition to that and do i all know no no, no. <laughs> i don't always you know give him that time but that's i think what he's saying yeah here. Yeah. Is that he wants the time even after your exactly. work, work is done. That's what he's saying. And it's not something that we should grouse about. It should be our joyful expectation that we do that for him. And, and that's kind of where we get with this whole thing here. I, I don't know somehow or another my uh, my progressive slides aren't here, but you know, because I had it was transitioning, but that's not working today. Um King Benjamin though kind of pins it down here in, in two. Two scriptures here. Uh, in in Mosiah 2 17, he says, Behold, I tell you these things that you may learn wisdom, that you learn that when you are in the service of your fellow beings, you are only in the service of your God. He's getting to the point that, okay, let's let's kind of make sure that God's in this thing here and whatever you're doing in your life, you know, you've got the world around you that you should be servicing. But while you're servicing that, you know, you're servicing God as well. But he gets to this point here. He says, I say unto you that if you should serve him who has created you um, from the very beginning and is preserving you from day to day by lending you breath, that you may live and move and do according to your own will and even supporting you from one moment to another. I say, if you should serve him with all your whole souls, yet you would be unprofitable servants. And, and that kind of cuts to the chase and something like that. We forget. I mean, yeah, we, we, we you know, we're, we're accomplishing all this stuff in life. You know, that's what we think. But this, he gets to this point here, says, you know, you remember who, who created you, you know, from the very beginning of our lives, you know, God was there. And from that point, when we breathe our first breath to, to our last breath, yeah, we go to work and we labor and we do all of our things. We're out there tending the plowing the fields and feeding the cattle and all that. And yet we got to do more for the Lord or other people around us. He says that he's preserving us from day to day. I don't think we realize that because we think we're accomplishing it. And, and to what extent he's giving us the wherewithal to do that. He blesses us with jobs and he blesses us with the energy and, and the education, and the opportunity to kind of get through our life every day. But you know, the underlying factor of that is that we're not accomplishing anything because he's preserving us from day to day by lending us breath. You know, this we're not, yeah, we're, we're not here forever, you know? And, 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 and so he is lending us the breath that we may live our life according to what we want, that freedom of choice that he gives us, that, that he's, he's lending us the opportunity <laughs> to kind of live as we might choose. He says, and move and, and do according to our own will, he's saying. I'm letting you do that. But there's an underlying thing there. Don't forget me, you know, because I, I, I expect something for you for what I'm preserving and what I'm lending. And, 
and how I'm letting you go and even supporting you from one moment to the next. And we don't think about that either. We think that somehow it's our, it's our own willpower and our own abilities that gets us from point A to point B without even thinking about the fact that God's moving me along. You know, he's given me the resources and the wherewithal to kind of go from point A to point B. And it's really not myself that's doing it. You know, we need that humbleness. We need that humility to know that God's in charge, not we are. And he says, you know, if we can remember all that stuff and we should serve him as, as mightily as we might, that no matter what, in God's eyes, we're still unprofitable because he's the one that's doing that for us. And, and I think that's the essence. I think Benjamin kind of reflects upon what Jesus's parable was that we just read in, in Luke there, that this is it. I mean, it's full circle. You know, we got to labor for God. That's our role in whatever he might bid us to do. And, and he's blessing us as we go along in life, but let's not get too far out here. You know, it's only because God is enabling us to have it happen. So I believe that's the end of that. Any comments on that one? I think it was a good input there. Just the, the perspective I think people often have is that this life is burdensome. And, and so there's some resentment we harbor about the responsibility and challenges we have to overcome. Mm -hmm. And we forget about it being, I mean, none of those uh, details included salvation. Like we were already in that just, just because of that. the gift of this life. Right. Um, and, and so I think we forget that you know, th this is a gift yeah. just to exist. And no matter how hard our lives are, there aren't too many probably who would say, I'd rather never have existed mm -hmm. than go through the hardships of life. Yeah. Because then I would have also missed out on existing and the experience and all the blessings yeah. of life. That's true. Good point. Okay, this one's a couple slides. This this uh, unmerciful servant one. So um, can we get somebody to read that one? Can you see it? Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said to, saith to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commended him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee pay the all. And he would not, but he but went and cast him in prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord after that had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked ser servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest now thou all also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on me. And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors so he should pay all that was due unto him so likewise shall my heavenly father do unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their i like this one uh, for a number of reasons uh so you know what do we think here uh heck. jesus told the parable of the unmerciful servant right after telling Peter to forgive someone 70 times seven. How likely are we to forgive someone any times for, for a similar offense? I mean, what's, do we, we try, but you know, we forgive, but we maybe don't forget. Yeah, well, we know that, uh, you know, well, hopefully, you know, 
but he's getting to a point here that you know uh, an unforgiving <laughs> spirit is not healthy for for away. our eternity it, it eats away and again in those last days that last day that we reconcile our life i mean do these unforgiving moments come into play mm -hmm. you know i don't know you know so i think it harboring anger harboring resentment harboring um you know whatever whatever you're you know holding on to in the past it will i think it will eat away at you and i think it's um it you know you lose you right. know you lose out on joy mm -hmm. because you're you're missing that peace in your heart and I think that it's a form of stress. I think, you know, we, yeah. there's so much out there today in medicine that, you know, stress can kill you. It literally will kill you. So I think it's a form of stress. I think that it, eventually it, it will eat away. Yeah. And you're just, you're not going to be a healthy person. You're not going to be healthy spiritually, emotionally, yeah. physically. And I think what that's what, again, the essence of this parable is again. I mean, he's taking a clear example of what, what someone forgave that person for and he didn't turn it around and and he's also telling us that that in that particular example if if you don't do what i've done for you in forgiving then what goes around comes around and that's what happened to this guy he ended up back in debt again and having to pay because he didn't have the compassion to do it in the first place like he was taught so he's putting it out there for the people at a time that you know you got to forgive you know Oops, what do they do here? Okay. What is the only request in the Lord's Prayer that has a catch to it? And in the Lord's Prayer, it says, you know, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. God really is an offend God. Yeah. He really wants us to follow through with his commandments. Yeah. And that's a, it's a tough one, but I think that's what we're supposed to, that's, that's a requirement. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. You can't confuse what he's saying in this situation here. So. Oh, oh sorry. I was going to no, say, uh, ahead, you're okay. um, <laughs> the, the mentality is interesting, right? Because the servant who owed, what was it, 10,000 or something, <laughs> You know, maybe he thought, well, what is that to my master because he has so much? Yeah, yeah. And maybe we do that with God, right? Maybe we say, well, um, the thing, my dealings with others are trivial compared to the Lord, and he's got everything, so what does he care, right? Yeah. And, and yet, the Lord does care even about the small debt yeah. between us and someone else. And so I think it's, it's reshaping how we think about God. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I was just going to say, it says, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, so neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Does that mean eternal life is out of the question if you don't forgive someone who has brought not? Well, that's what I'm saying. I think at the end, when they open up that book and you see what your life's about, he's going to say, you know what? You had this ought against this person or whatever. And you know, for the many oughts that you've had in your life, I've forgiven you. But you haven't done that same thing. Yeah, I think the scripture is setting before us a high bar and is saying, your thinking is not God's thinking. And we have to surrender our thinking. Right. And break past our, you know, limited perspectives. And yeah. Say, you know, hey, if the idea here is that I'm not worthy of salvation, save it be for the grace and forgiveness of God, mm -hmm. then that grace and forgiveness is the clincher. <laughs> and, and, and I can't yeah. forgive the small debts to others. This is what he's saying, that yeah. the Lord would not. Then it's not it. yours either. Yeah, so, so we're, we're definitely yeah. risking salvation on this point. Yeah, and if we couldn't figure it out from here, you know, we know that song from Frozen, right? Let it go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, but there is degree. Let's look at World War II and the Jews, what they did to those people. Yeah. 
were they able to forgive being tormented and experiments done on their bodies and the pain they went through? I just wonder, can't they be excused? I mean, that well, was- I think that's a good point. But then again, I think what God's saying is um, if, if you leave it up to you, you're not going to be able to do that. Okay. And I think what he's saying is if you leave it up to me, I can take that. And there have been Jews that went through the Holocaust that have forgiven yeah. them what they've done in that situation. Not, How? not many publicly. Only, only with that. Oh, but that's the only way you can do that. Same thing with, with someone who might kill my kids right. or my grandkids. I mean, I mean, you hear those stories about how people forgive them and you say, "Uh uh-uh, this, I can't fathom that, you know, I mean, an eye for an eye would be the reaction that you would have in something like that, but what this is saying, no, 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 you don't have that ability to make that judgment, you know, you've got to do what I would do for you, and that was, I would forgive you in in your many cases. I think you find solace in the idea of God being judged. You know, and if you think about court hearings and men who are judges, how can they possibly calculate the impact of a crime and then in turn calculate the, the sentence? Yeah. You know, it's really beyond our minds Absolutely. to be able to do this. And so we find, I think, a release from all that anger somewhat to, to say, well, God's the judge. He says, vengeance is mine. He'll take care of you know, that person when their time comes. When their time comes. And he'll do it in a way that, you know, is is <laughs> more uh, infinitely wiser than what we could. Right. And when you think about that, I mean, an eternal consequence is beyond our capability to comprehend as well. So, you know, I think that lets you off the hook. Someone yeah. can say, well, God's going to take care of this. We yeah. understand there's evil in the world. It, it's definitely disturbing to us, but I can't solve it, and I'm not in a position to right this situation. Yeah. And, and you know, too, every single person, every single human being is a soul that God desires to save, even if they're murderers. I mean, Paul was a murderer. Mm-hmm. Murderer. He was like an ISIS terrorist today. So, like, and he became one of the greatest disciples of Christ. Right. So, you never know, you know, who whose life you're going to touch. And if you do forgive someone of some great heinous crime against you, what that effect could have on that other person mm-hmm. and perhaps save their soul. You just true. never know. That's true. You just never know. And we can, we are, we're not the judge of that. Like we can't say that person is not worthy, you know, I mean, thank God I've never lived through a Holocaust situation where I'd have to forgive a a taskmaster like that. That would be awful. I can't possibly even imagine what it'd be like. But that person is still a soul. It's horrible as whatever they did. It's hard for us to, like, it's hard for us to fathom and comprehend that. Yeah. But God can change anyone. Well, again, it depends upon how deep our faith actually goes. Because we have faith, you know, and it kind of goes to a point. And then, you know, the human nature comes in and and we we bottom out, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, what should be our faith in the Lord and what Jesus is trying to tell people in these parables, all of a sudden we we rationalize why I don't have to feel that way. You know, and and we go on from there. And I think that's that's the problem that we've got. Our our faith just does not take us all the way yet, you know, to just completely trust, you know, what God's gonna do. I mean, yeah, he does say vengeance is mine saying the Lord, but um it, sometimes it's not fast enough for us. It's not uh mm-hmm. it's not it's not in you know terrible enough or whatever, you know, to to, to make things even so to speak, you know, so, you know, we have to do it our way, and and, and it's all, but your point's right, I mean, every every person, you know, even Hitler had a soul, you know, right. you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry in that situation, but, you know, something went haywire with that guy sure. down the road that made him be what he was, but nevertheless, and I don't believe Hitler went to heaven, but I think that, you know, uh, 
the potentials there for any of these people that you know they could they could be saved in the end. Well, I think that's the thing. You know, when you read the story of Pharaoh versus Moses, it's like the Lord gave Pharaoh unto himself. He let him continue in this you know wickedness. And he hardened his heart mm -hmm. to the point that he he was he was lost. Mm -hmm. And so you can certainly see how that could be a possibility in a Hitler situation mm -hmm. or something. But the, every single person starts out with something that the Lord's given them, a soul yeah. that the Lord's given them. Yeah. So, and it isn't up to us to say, well, that person deserves to hear the gospel or not. That person deserves salvation or not. Yeah, because we we're not the judge, fortunately. Yeah, we just can't judge it. Yeah, that's true. I need to go back to, you talked about Paul. Paul was a murderer and Paul ended up being one of the uh, foundations of, of Christ's church. Uh, and, and I go back to David. He was a murderer too. And, right. and he was crazy sometimes. Mm -hmm. But what's the scripture tells about him? He was a man for God's own heart. And, and he got forgiven, you know, as he forgave himself in a lot of cases, because he put himself out there in such a way that he was a mess because of what he did. And he remembered that. And, you know, the Lord even forgave him for thinking bad things about himself in that situation. So the potential is always there. And I guess uh, when we get into this point here, again, somehow, some way, we've got to develop the faith to be able to forgive and uh, kind of get onto it. Alma's got some good stuff here. He says uh, in Mosiah, uh, instructions from God. And God's talking to Alma in this situation. He says, therefore, I say unto you, go and, and whosoever transgresseth against me, uh, him shall you... Uh, does it say, judge according to the sins which he had committed. And if he confess his sins before thee and me and repenteth in the sincerity of his heart, him shall you forgive and I will forgive him also. Yea, and as often as my people repent, will I forgive them of their trespasses against me and ye shall also forgive one another your trespasses. For verily I say unto you that he that forgiveth not his neighbor's trespasses when he says that he repents, the same hath brought himself under condemnation. It's kind of what Jesus talked about in the parable. It's what he said in the Lord's Prayer. You know, you, you, you got to forgive because if you don't, I don't. I think um, we, I have to think of the consequences of me not forgiving. Do I want to give up eternal life in heaven to a joy? Or am I going to be condemned? Because I didn't forgive. I think the long-term effect on our eternal life is if we could just remember that. Right. Are yeah. you willing to Forgive. give that up? Yeah. How scary is that? Sure. Ugh. And that's why I say, too, it's like, you know, if I'm if talking to somebody who's having a hard time forgiving somebody else, I'll say, you know, picture yourself standing before Christ with all of your sin all of the mistakes that you've made, all of the things that you've done wrong. You can't come before him and say, this person, because that person's not there. Mm -hmm. It's just you and the Lord and your sin. Mm -hmm. And so you, it's so it's it's hard, but you have to put yourself in that perspective. Mm -hmm. If I were to lose my life today, is anything worth the Lord looking at me? Mm -hmm. with sorrow in his heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't imagine that. And so that's the thing. It's like, there's just nothing. There's nothing worth. I, I don't, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter how hard that person hurts you. There's nothing worth it. Yeah. To lose your time with the Lord forever. And we got to think about it before that time comes. Right. Because at that time, there's nothing sure, you can do about it. Do. So. You know, so, so we've got to keep that conscious thought in our mind. And, and like you said, you know, at the moment, the emotion of the situation is so great that we forget about maybe the eternity that comes after the fact, you know, sure, and, and trying sure. to catch ourselves. So uh, you can't do that by yourself. It just does not happen by ourselves. Mentally, we can't, we can't deal with that. You know, we got to have the Lord there at all times. Yeah. Well, one time my feelings got hurt 
at church, of course. Where else does it happen? <laughs> Where it hurts you the most. Sure. And I'm driving home and I said, I am done with that place. I am not going to subject myself to having people criticize me and they don't like this and they're like, God, Lord, I said, I am not going to church anymore. I'm done. So I went to take a nap and I prayed that God would take that feeling away. When I woke up, the feeling was gone. Mm. And I thought, that song, don't let anybody take your crown. Mm. That's, I'm, I'm not losing my life with Jesus for that person hurting my feelings. Lord, take it away. And he did. Mm -hmm. You know, he, it, it was, I mean, I woke up and I was like a new person. You know, I thought, oh my gosh, that was quick, Lord. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And I didn't give up my soul to be because of that person. Yeah. And, and that's, it's, that, it's crazy. That song, my Lord can. Yes. To heal my broken heart again. Yes. Yeah. He'll heal it over and over and over again. If you ask. Mm -hmm. right. Well, this <laughs> kind of like changes the direction a bit, but maybe not. We'll see how we'll come out to this. The rich man, that's not the Lazarus that got resurrected from the dead. This is a different Lazarus. So we can get a reader here for a couple of slides. Can I just the passage? Yes. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and also was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, <coughs> in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham, Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that came from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wilt send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that they may testify unto them, lest they also should come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Okay. Let's make this clear. Here he's telling the Pharisees, uh, uh, and what do the Pharisees think about wealth? You know, wealth represented a position of power and prestige, and, and they were all striving for it. They all had it, and they all felt because they were better, they deserved other honored places in the synagogues and the feasts. So this guy was, uh, you know, he cast aside the effects of what Lazarus's problem was, and it was just about him. And uh, what does this parable tell us about Lazarus the beggar? Uh, he was not only poor, I mean, it was a pretty disgusting description. You know, he had festering sores on his body, dogs came to lick it off, and he didn't have the strength to chase the dogs away. I mean, he was in, he was in pathetic shape. Uh, but it tells us that he was inside a godly man, righteous, or the angels wouldn't have carried him away in that situation. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's a lot of God's dearest people that are greatly afflicted in the world today. And for the rest of the world, you know, they're people that have failed in life or, you know, they deserve their lot in life or, or whatever. Uh, and Jesus referred to him in this parable by name. I know, but we didn't know the name of the rich guy. So that's telling us something again about how Jesus treats people that they're underdogs, so to speak, that are special to him in that way. And uh, did a rich man go to hell because he did not give food to Lazarus? 
you know, uh, he's introduced by Jesus without any details of who he is or whatever. He's nameless. He shows that he was, you know, probably rich and noble because of what he had worn, but we're not told about how he got his wealth or, but he didn't show Lazarus any compassion. I think we're getting to the point now of what this parable was. He provided for himself only and disobeyed one of the core commandments of God, and that's reaching out to those of need. So again, Jesus is telling these people, you know, you've got this obligation for people that are not as good as you and, and maybe not as fortunate or as blessed as you. So, uh, what does this tell us about heaven and hell? It's telling us another story here. Mm -hmm. You know, one that they're both real places, Jesus is telling us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people don't want to talk about hell. You know, I guess maybe that's too close to home, you know, because it's, uh, it makes people feel bad. I don't know why we don't want to talk about that, but we'll talk about heaven until the cows come home, but we're not going to talk about hell, you know, but Christ spoke about hell many times. And so did his, his disciples. And the Bible is clear that, you know, we're going to spend an eternity in one place or the other. And once you, and what it's just telling us is once you cross that line, they ain't no coming back because that parable talked about the, the chasm that was between and how they, how Lazarus couldn't come back and touch his lips with water in that situation. It's that's no more chances. Once the bell rings and you're gone, that's it. You know, you've made your... You, you, people that don't read the scripture don't know that, right? Oh. That, wait. Okay, go ahead. No, I'm not. I'm just no, saying, no, no. If you don't read and you don't go to church and you... I know, they say, oh, everybody knows right from wrong. But if they don't know, that's it. Well, I don't want to say that they have a pass. But I think there's something tells us that if they hadn't heard the word, you know, they, yeah, yeah, they based on what they, they based on what they know. They don't know. They don't know. Yeah. But it's it's getting harder and harder not to know something. Right. Yeah, because in this day and age, if you have a phone, you have access to the word. That's true. And so you're responsible for what you're given. Yes. Whether and that's one of the things that's written in the Book of Mormon is that even if you are given the word, if you have access to the word and you don't read it, that's your exactly. responsibility. Right. And you're responsible for that. So that's what's so it's so scary is that you know, even though I, I mean I have it all, but if I haven't read it, that's my problem. Yeah. I think even more condemning once you've had it and no, don't pay attention to it that that's a different situation you're you're kind of doomed at that point right you know so again you can't be responsible for anybody else except yourself i mean you you can help somebody understand the scriptures a little bit and whether it's fine you do that with your brother you know and you know people like those people they got some reckoning to deal with because they know that's a, that's really it's very concerning. yeah and that yeah, and it, it it breaks your heart, but you know, I, maybe this is not right to say. I think to some extent we got to be selfish, and we got to make sure that we're checking in okay. And yeah, I, I I will try my darndest to help people understand, but if they don't want to accept it, okay. if they if they don't make that their choice, um, that's their choice, and they're here like this guy, you know. And, and we're going to find out a little bit more. You know, he's talking about, well, you know, send Lazarus down to talk to my brothers, right? Okay. Uh, that's, I think, what's coming up next here. But you know what? That part where um, he knows he has the milk, but he doesn't have the meat. I mean, he doesn't understand. There are people that really don't get right. it. Right. So... And I can't be responsible, like you said, for all those other people. But they really don't get it. Some of the things they say, we go, where did they get that? That's not what the Lord says. It, it just blows my mind. Do they don't get it? Or it doesn't get it. fit no. their definition no. of what? No, they don't always say it. they don't get it. Because if they knew the, the consequences, they would get it. I'm not sure about that. 
My brother doesn't get it. And I just, he doesn't seem to understand the importance. Um, and he reads the Bible and he still doesn't well, get it. I don't know. I can't make excuses for him, but I just think he doesn't get the importance of knowing the Lord and what the consequences are. I don't know. That's just my personal opinion. Almost as though we're kind of given an accountability for this life we've been gifted. And, and to wonder to some extent, you know, well, how did I get here? Yeah. And is this a miracle, you know, that I should regard mm -hmm. in a certain way? And so it's such a telling statement that, you know, here's a rich man saying, if you sent someone from the dead, they would convince my family. Yeah. And the answer is no, they no, won't. And really? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, then something else is going on. There's a level of denial within people. That's right. That they're really not facing reality. You're living in a dream world that they've concocted that is yeah. not true, you know. And so they How do we you, get you, it to them. How yeah, we... it's so. I mean, that's sort of the lesson here is that they wouldn't be convinced. And no you matter what, them right? That, that okay, because they could not be convinced, they're accountable. That's right. Yeah. You know, a couple of months ago, we went to the Rockies game, and Rock doesn't park near the stadium. He parks far away, so we had to. So, you know, we get out at night and we're walking past all the bars. It was a Saturday night and the bars were full. And I, and for the first oh. time, you don't know that, but for the first time, I remember saying, oh my gosh, when the day comes, that day of reckoning, are these people going to get on the boat, you know, the arc of safety, or are they just going to say, like you just said, deny it and say, I'm eating, drinking, and merry. I'm having a yeah. good old time. I'm not giving this up. I don't care if... Today is the end of the world, and my soul, you know, I'm just having a little, <coughs> and boy, it made such an impact on that time. And I looked at these people, and I thought, are, are you going to get on the boat, or mm -hmm. not, you know, but like to Jeremy's point, they're having a good old time, not even thinking no. down the road no. what's, you know, and, and God said, you know, the pandemic, and that didn't shake anybody up, now, you know, so COVID, I, I think as next you know, as as it gets time, time comes and things get. You know, I don't even know if that will shape. No, I see. You know, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think it will. A ripening of iniquity. Yeah, and idea. and that's yeah. right. and and so we aren't responsible for them, but we need to pray for them because those souls could be lost forever. Exactly. You know, so it is our responsibility. For, and I and I and I felt that that night. I thought I need to pray for the world that's dying in sin. I never thought that before. Yeah. You know? But when I saw it with my own eyes, I just thought. Well, they succumb to what the Book of Mormon tells us that in the last days, people are going to say, eat, drink, and be yeah. merry, for we serve a loving God that will beat us with a few stripes mm -hmm. and we'll go on. So they're just thinking about now. Yeah. There's no thought in anybody's mind about this concept of heaven and hell. It's not there. It's like, I'm here in the bar. Yeah. This is what it is. And, you know, there's a God out there, but you know what? He's a good guy. And he's going to say, you're all right. You're not doing bad things. So just keep it up. And that's what the evil one allows us to do. And, you know, for the sake of, of those of us that, that are trying to hang on to something with a little more lasting thing, again, first and foremost, I, I suggest we have to be selfish. For one thing, <clears throat> we don't lose our way in the same manner and say, well, yeah, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but God's a good fellow and he knows my intent. And, you know, uh, but then, then I go to bed tonight and I don't wake up and I'm now facing him with this list. And you know what? You know, too bad because I'm not on the heaven side at that point in time. And there's nothing I can do about it at that point. That, that I, song, Wait in the Balance. Yeah. Uh, you know, mercy won't ju draw justice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So Alma says something here. We see that death comes upon mankind, the death which has been spoken of by Amulek, which is the temporal death. Nevertheless, there was a space granted unto what men might repent. Therefore, this life becomes a predationary state, time to prepare to meet God, a time to prepare for that endless state, which has been spoken of by us, which is after the resurrection of the dead. This is it. Right. I, I think Jesus was trying to tell that guy, you know, you missed your chance. Right. You know, you're done. You, 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 you're here now. And and no amount of talking or preaching or anything that's going to bring anything back again. And uh, 
when believers die, they're, you know, they are immediately in conscious fellowship and uh, with the joys of, of heaven. You know, on the other hand, when unbelievers die, there is just as immediately in the consciousness of pain, suffering, and the torment of hell, which this guy discovered. And he was aware of that, you know. The rich man didn't ask for his brothers to pray for his release from the torment because he knew that he was there, you know, and he knew why he was there. But he was asking on behalf of his brothers. I think this is the point you're saying, Jeremy. We can't do this. Abraham made it clear to the rich man there was no hope of ever mitigating his pain, suffering, or sorrow. His brothers didn't heed the words of the prophets. There was no hope for them, also. I mean, the words out there, just like in the world today, the words out there for everybody to pay attention to. But do they listen? Rich men thought his brothers would believe someone risen from the dead by bringing the scriptures forth, and they would, well, did that happen to Laman and Lemuel? How many times did that occur where God himself came down and shook them? You know, and I guarantee you that I think if God put his hands on me and shook me, that would have changed my way of life. But with those dudes, you know, they kept on hardening their hearts. How many times did the scripture talk about their hardened hearts? You know, what Abram said is that wouldn't work. You know, you know, 2000 years, we've got Jesus Christ's gospel, you know, and people don't believe that message at all. That's not working. And it's not much different to people like in this parable today. So anyhow, those were the three. We took a long time today. But, um, you know, I, I think that's that's kind of like our awareness. We just need to kind of make sure that we're okay. And, and we need yeah. to concern ourselves with all these people that are believing other things or don't want to pay attention or want to rationalize that, you know, I serve a good God who's going to just, kind of like point his finger at me and say don't do that again you know and you know we 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 live that way until we're not here anymore there was a commercial couple like last year ronnie um raven's son ron raven's son came on yeah mm -hmm. and he said i'm an atheist and yeah. um i'm not afraid of hell and i thought <gasps> if you Whoa, know, what if is you it? knew what you were saying if you knew what you were saying, and I, I made my hair, it's still there. Oh, this guy needs to read this parable yeah. because uh, if you knew what you were saying was different. Than, yeah. yeah, well, this guy in the parable yeah. will tell him another story. You leave yourself um, to be frightened in anything to the point that God just simply does not deal with you. And that's a dangerous, oh, a dangerous yeah. place to be. And I think it's so interesting. I love that passage of scripture because I think it's it's a clue as to the difference of prior to Christ's death and resurrection to after Christ's death and resurrection. Richmond and Lazarus is a story that Christ told while he was alive. And I, I think that it's it's very for me, it's a telling story. It's I one of my, my favorite passages because it tells us where Abraham's bosom was prior to Christ's death. It actually was in a similar place to hell, Sheol. And when Christ died, it says that he fled to captivity captive. He literally went there on our behalf and led those in Abraham's bosom out. Mm -hmm. And now paradise is in a local, is a different place. It's a different location. It's literally located somewhere different, mm -hmm. I think, now. And it's so interesting. I just love that passage because it's it's telling that prior to Christ's death, they were in a place of comfort. I mean, Abraham's bosom was a place of comfort, but it wasn't a place of paradise. Right. Because Christ hadn't resurrected right. yet. And when he did, they were seen walking the streets. Exactly. Can you imagine? For again, it's a, it was for a those people that didn't believe, would that not have motivated them? <laughs> that something's different here? Something's going on. Because that guy's dead. You know? Like right. Lazarus and, and the other Lazarus guy. Right. You know? Whoa, you know? Something happened here. <laughs> yeah, I got to pay attention. You know, maybe this is right. Anyhow, that's the end of that. Um, okay, we're going to sing a song for sacrament. And uh, Brother Jeremy's going to open it. All right, we'll stop that share and maybe pull up a song here. Oh, that's right.
guys. Just get it on her. Get it. It's just. I mean, the thing is, I feel God like it's worth it for me. It's just submit. It's submit. It's the big yeah. gift. Be so they did it before. Death in the family, their own sickness, losing a child. They still don't get it. 9 11. Did they get it for well, a month? And I talk about your brother whose head hit the pavement after his car got hit. And he's on still. Motorcycle, and, and, and the car's tire missed his head by, by, 12 by 12 inches. If that doesn't motivate you to say, you know what? You know, maybe I got to change my ways. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, I mean, thank God. I mean, one of the things I definitely thank God for is a willing heart. Like a, a heart that has a desire. Because some people's hearts just aren't there. And you can talk and you blew in the face. It doesn't and, matter. You know, until they're willing to accept. Even a tragedy in one's life doesn't turn them around. I mean, you just got to give it to God. That's There's right. nothing else you can do. That's right. Break my heart. a lot to think about and uh, a lot of meat this morning. I really hope that I can personally spend a sufficient amount of time you know, in the coming days to consider his lesson and what it means to me in my life and the lives of those around us. And uh, he talked about a master and a servant and uh, the uh, some of the facets of, of that relationship, and that's kind of an interesting thought. And um, you know how sometimes uh, people are surprised; they're caught off guard 
by uh, the dynamics of that relationship. Uh, we, we have all these uh, inconsistencies, these contradictions, right? That, well, it's okay that I receive all this, but give very little. Uh, I don't pay it forward or I don't treat others the way uh, I would like to be treated when, you know, the Lord works with me. And so, um, you know, it's it's like that song we just sang, and uh, I think Lynette referenced it, and there's also a line in there that says, and he, the Lord, can search the hidden heart inside. And, you know, that's a, that's an interesting thought that I wanted to speak about today. And so my, my theme today is searching. And I wanted to talk about it from two different perspectives. The first one is that we would search our hearts and understand what's hidden in there. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking about my first real job, my first above the table job, right? Because as I was uh, a teenager, I did odd jobs, mowed lawns, you know, farm work. But my first real job where I paid taxes was at the co-op, uh, which is kind of the farmer's gas station, right? And you go into these places and you can get your oil change and you can also pick up, uh, uh, you know, things for your farm equipment as well as get gas. And one of the things that we would have to do at least... Uh, maybe a couple times a year, is take inventory. And this was before we had very sophisticated software and systems to do that. And so it was a horrible uh, task. Uh, we'd have, we had this little warehouse, basically, full of tires and oil filters and air filters and all these things and not labeled very well. They were often in these generic boxes. And you had to somehow figure out, well, what do we have? And how do we take account for what we've used and what we've charged money for and make sure we're on the up and up. And what else do we need to order, right? And we would just go through. I mean, uh, it's funny because it was so much work that my boss, who was such a great guy, he was an old um, truck driver. And for many years, he drove truck and uh, smoked like a chimney. Mm -hmm. And his health started to deteriorate from driving, you know, I guess on his nerves. And so he started this job and running this co-op. and. It was so much work to do the inventory that his wife felt bad for him and would come and help. And I would just dread these days. She would come in there with this clipboard and we would painstakingly start tallying everything in this warehouse. And, uh, you know, what's, what's interesting is you just don't know what you have until you look. And it makes me also think about another analogy and that's uh, spring cleaning. And every once in a while, I think about this spiritual parallel. Uh, you know, what has crept into your fridge or underneath your fridge or in that closet no one's allowed to go into or the basement or the attic? What's in there? I don't know. I couldn't tell you until I start digging and think, oh my goodness, I haven't thought about this for years. Oh, wait a minute. I bought three more of these and I had one here. And, you know, it just goes on and on. And, and you think, well, why is it so hard for us to keep track of what we have? And maybe it's because we have too much. And we have to understand that the way God works, and, and this is a crushing reality I, that Walt brought out you know, in the scriptures this morning, is that there are trade-offs. And we have to pick this or that. And ultimately, this life is about a decision. Am I going to pick this or that? And in order for me to make room for this, if I say, no, this is what matters. It's good. It's God approved. And it will set me up for the kingdom. Then that's what I want to choose. It's like, okay, you say that. But in order to choose this, you got to get rid of that. Because you can't have both. And that's the crushing reality for many. Is that they're not really willing to part with that to get this. And the Lord's saying, when you say you choose me, I expect you to mean it. And so, um, what is this and that? And how do we, you know, take inventory of our hearts? And what's lurking in there? 
And have we really cleared out enough space in our hearts to make room for the good things of God? You know, we um, were just uh, trading out vehicles and campers this week. And, you know, a car is not that big of a space, but you can cram the glove box and the center console and under the seats and the pockets of the seats. And you think, you know, this is ridiculous. And I, there was so much stuff in our camper. No wonder the thing broke. <laughs> it was carrying all this weight and baggage. You know, no wonder we break sometimes under the stress, like you were saying, of carrying these things around. Things that we really don't need. And, you know, they prevent us from really enjoying the point. You know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, the more you have, the harder it is to get to what you need. And, and to enjoy it, right? Well, let's see what the scriptures say uh, about this. David, and Walt talked about David this morning. And he came to the Lord with this really interesting question. In, in Psalms 139, the 23rd verse, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if there be any wicked way in me, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. And so I thought, you know, that's a good request to bring before God that we would say, Lord, please help me to inventory my heart and, and to reveal to me what's lacking, what I need to get rid of. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm not aware. Or maybe I'm not really aware of the false reality or denial, you know, that I've created in my life. And he's saying, show me if there's wickedness and lead me in a good way. And that, that would be my request to God today. And, and that, that's something we can ask God. Ask God to show us what we need to change in our lives. And, you know, I think that there are hints along the way that sometimes people ignore um, you know, there, there, there's going to undoubtedly be this moment where you have to confront reality with God in the room, right? And, and, and we do worry a lot about settling the score and injustice, and it's all we can talk about as a society, the injustices and in inequalities of the world. And in so doing, we deny God, because God has said, I will settle the score on Judgment Day. And on the other side of that, can you imagine how silly it will sound to say, oh, but Lord, you remember that one day in that short vapor of life when that injustice existed for a moment in eternity and you took your time settling that? It's like, no, we're not going to think that way when we're in eternity because we're going to finally open our minds to the realization that this life is nothing. Compared to that, it's a drop in the bucket. And we're going to see the justice of God, and we're going to see the woes of our ways, and how we didn't really trust the Lord enough to follow him and, and what he said. And, and there's these warning signs along the way that I think we'll finally realize, oh, that's a huge whoops, you know, because I, I overlooked all these indicators that were saying all is not well in your heart. Uh, and, and I think it's our emotions. I think it's the level of, of peace, the amount of peace we have in our lives. Maybe it's how well we sleep at night. You hear that saying, right? Um, and, and there's also the fruits of the spirit. Do we feel... The, the, the fruits of God flowing you know, through us in our lives. And it's also in the manifestations of God's gifts. Do we feel him speaking to us? Is he um, uh, revealing his power? You know, do we have experiences? You know, all of these things are, are really telling us where we stand with God. Because if God's really quiet, he's not saying much. Uh, then there's a problem. And, and that's really what we're building up to because we want to have good indicators. And if we look at uh, 
where this loop truck has got gauges like crazy. And it's telling you how everything's performing. And I thought, boy, that'd be nice to have the digital gauge panel for my sphere <laughs> to tell me, you know, this is getting a little low and it needs attention, you know. And I think we do have that. We just have to pay attention to it. And so what I should be seeing in my life is not a fixation on the material things, not a fixation on the temporal things. You know, that poor man with the, the festering sores and poverty and hunger, you might say, well, he had a justified need. But those were all temporary. They weren't spiritual. And that just flips your thinking, doesn't it? How much effort do we put into, you know, what does the scripture say? You know, physical exercise profits a little. You know, physical health, it's a nice thing. But how long does it really last? Where is your spiritual health today? So what should we have? You know, we, we should have those things I said. We should have joy. We should have hope. We should have purpose. Do we understand the purpose of our lives? Because there's not much more fulfilling in life than a, a godly purpose you know, that we're focused on and that we're working towards. Uh, and Alma said in the fifth chapter, uh, he, he talks about the things we have to get rid of. You know, so if you're ready to do spring cleaning in your soul and get rid of all the junk, if it's purging day, right, and you're going to dust under the rugs today, <laughs> um, he says in the 28th verse, Behold, are ye stripped of pride? I say unto you, if ye are not, ye are not prepared to meet God. And boy, this is what we're talking about. Tonight. We would prepare and, and be in good standing before the Lord. He says, Behold, ye must prepare quickly. Okay. It's waking me up here. We got to get to work. And I got to do the work that the Lord has said to do quickly. For the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. You know, that's interesting because I, I don't understand always what the New Testament means when it says the kingdom is at hand. Here it says the kingdom is soon at hand. It's like, okay, if it's not here yet, but it's soon, and I have something to do between now and then. You know, again, this is charging me up. It's motivating me spiritually to wake up and take care of business. And he says... Uh, you know, such a one, right, who is not stripped of pride, hath not eternal life. And we kind of sit there and we say, well, okay, God's saying to do this and that, but is it really that important? He's saying, look, if you don't do it, you can't come in. And so these are very serious words. And he says in the next verse, behold, I say, is there one among you who is not stripped of envy? And that's kind of like the other extreme, right? Maybe I'm prideful because I have so much. Or maybe I'm kind of upset because I have so little. Either way, I'm missing the mark. The Lord is saying, look, I've got the storehouse of all blessings available to you. If you would just put your faith in me today and, and immediately claim victory and, and, and all that you need that can be made available to you today, you can have if you would have faith in me. And so... I say, again, he says the same word, such a one is not prepared and shall not be found guiltless. And in Mormon, uh, the ninth chapter, uh, he says uh, in 28, be wise in the days of your probation. <laughs> you know, it is a gift to this life. And, and I don't do a good enough job of appreciating it in every day. And I worry about the wrong things and I, I, I miss the point. So often, and it's frustrating to me. And, and somewhat, I find some solace in the idea that even if I did my best, it still would be unprofitable. And so that means, okay, I, what's my reasonable goal then? I'm not really going to be profitable, but what's enough in my life that I might come before the Lord one day and say, Father, I believe sincerely that I fall short, but... I've done enough, I hope, in my life to, to demonstrate real faith, to demonstrate that I believed in you, that I was willing to part with all this. 
that, you know, if the day came where you said, leave it and start walking down the road design, that I would do it because I understand having known all the people before me in life who eventually ended in this life. I understand that's, it's temporary and there's something greater. There's something more today to pursue. So he says, be wise in the days of your probation. Strip yourselves of all uncleanness. We've got to do the inventory. <laughs> it's not a fun job. <laughs> but here's the thing. You don't really know what you have until you look. I mean, we were shocked yesterday. <laughs> what in the world is all this stuff? We opened up uh, this little bench in the camp where we opened it up. And there was a zillion toys from when Caitlin was five and six, and we started to get emotional. And we, for, you know, even Caitlin forgot all this stuff was in there. You know, you <clears throat> don't know what's in your heart. Number one, number two, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that not only do you not know, but it's probably in worse shape than you think. So let's face it today. Because the Lord is saying, look, if you're willing to roll up your sleeves today and not procrastinate your salvation, I'll come in with you and help you clean it up. That's something we can rejoice about today. So he says, uh, ask not that you may consume it on your lusts, but ask with a firmness unshaken that ye will, will, ye will yield to no temptation." but that ye will serve the true and living God. You know, so we, we get rid of the, the bad, and then we focus on the good, which is what he just described, that we would be firm and, and pursuing a true and living God and, and, and avoiding sin. And, uh, you know, Ephesians talks about this in, in even more detail. The fifth chapter, the third verse, it says, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And I want to focus on that because, you know, it's such a drudgery <laughs> to our, our human minds to hear the list of things that are not allowed. <laughs> but the upside is, okay, here comes the trade-off again. If you get rid of that, you get something else in return. This heart full of things, this joyful existence. And, and that's where the focus should be. And he goes on, he says, you know, these people who are unclean, who are covetousness, who are idolaters, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of, of Christ and, and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye, therefore, partakers with them. So we have to go our different way. And um, so we, we've kind of laid out what happens when you search your heart. And, and after you go through the shock of, oh, I didn't know that was there. And boy, I'm not in maybe as good a shape as I like. The third problem is, now how do I fix it? And uh, that transitions us now to the next kind of searching. So first we search our hearts, then we search for God. And uh, that's where our focus should be. And I think this is, I, I don't know if I can boil it down any more simple than this. Stop searching for the things of the world and start searching for the things of God. And that will line you up to the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, what does the Lord tell us? That we should diligently seek him. That we should seek first, what? The kingdom of heaven. And, and that means today that you have full permission from God to forget about the other things that you were stressing out about. And to remember that he wants you to focus on something different. And in the Book of Mormon, in the first uh, book of Nephi, 1019, it says, For he that diligently seeketh shall find. And so that's the if then again, right? And if we are diligently seeking, we know we're in good 
standing. We're in a good place. He says, that person shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost. And we should see that power in our lives. We need to aliven, uh, enliven our faith today and make sure that our walk with the Lord is alive and well and that, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, that wonderful scripture that, you know, our hope shineth more and more unto the perfect day. We, we talked about this on Friday, how that uh, every day you live is a day closer to the kingdom in one way, shape, or form. And that should excite us um, because it means I've gotten through one more day of the trials of this life. And I'm one day closer to something greater. And so um, I hope and pray that the Lord will keep us focused and disciplined, that we would have the strength to endure to the end. And in order to do that, I think we have to make sure we can say the Lord, I diligently sought you. I looked for you. And that's what I think is, is beef with the people who don't, who kind of just take for granted this gift of life and just squander it. You know, for lack of a better description, uh, the Lord wants us to value what he's given us and to understand if you value it now in this life, I'll give you a life that never ends. I don't think we can put it into words what that means. And so I hope that the Lord will focus us. Um, help us not to forget. Help us not to be deceived. Help us not to lose our way. But may God bless you. Amen. Okay, we're going to open it up to testimony. But looks like first person is not.